In this episode, I talk about if ink choice really matters for high-end pens, what's my go-to pen for trying out new inks, and which is better for newbies, more pens or more ink? Hey there, Brian Goulet here, GoulaiPens.com, and it is episode number 154 of Goulet Q&A. I am just, just on the verge of thinking I could possibly be getting a sore throat. So I may be having some cough drops, drinking a little bit of tea, and it always seems to be that whenever I start to get sick, it starts in Q&A and it ends up in a coughing fit. So I'm really going to try not to do that for you here today. I have been really trying to take care of myself, drinking a lot of fluids, and my whole family's been sick and everybody around me is sick and I'm trying to fight it off, but I don't know if I can resist it forever. So if I do have to pause here and there for a sip or a cough drop, that is why. It is for the greater good of the community here. Um, this past week has been pretty fun. I've had uh, my son's birthday party. My son turned seven last week. Um, he is my eldest. And uh, so I now have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, which is just crazy. Uh, it's always interesting because my son was born right around the time that we started this business. I started doing the videos and blogging and stuff like that. So uh, it's not just you know, my son's kind of birthday uh, that I'm thinking about, but it's just how far Goulet Pens has come along in that time. So it's always a very reflective time for me. You know, it's in January, it's kind of the start of the new year and all that, so uh, very reflective time. But uh, it was interesting because we were going to do it at like it's one of these inflatable places and have it all nice and kind of orchestrated at the place and it ended up falling through. So we had it at our house instead. And uh, that was really interesting. <laughs> He did have a lot of kids show up. It was only a handful, but still, just a handful of kids was literally quite the handful. So, uh, you know, that was, uh, Rachel and I are both actually fairly introverted in our personal lives. And so having that many kids to take care of was uh, a bit of an experience, if only for a couple of hours. So I know a lot of you can relate to that. Uh, it was still a lot of fun though, made lots of great memories, uh, but it was very interesting and we were very ready for when that party was over. Um, let's see here, preparing for new products. You know, we've got some new stuff. Whenever we have the end of the year, beginning of the year is always a little slow to pick up. That's definitely the case this year. We do have some new stuff that's starting to come in though. Um, and we got a lot more new stuff that we're kind of preparing for coming up. So I don't have a lot that's like, yeah, this is coming tomorrow, but uh, I do have a lot of stuff that's gonna be coming in February. Um, one new thing that has come in is the Montegrappa Passion. Uh, I am recently infatuated with this pen personally after seeing it on my uh, kind of, you know, calligrapher idols uh, site, uh, Jake Weidman. So he's a, uh, a big fan, or I'm a big fan of his. Um, he was using this pen, we carry Monograppa. So I just wanted to carry this specific pen kind of for that reason, but it's a really nice pen. Sterling silver accents. I don't have a lot of pens with sterling silver. I just have a handful, it's a couple of them. Usually they're very expensive. Um, this one, because it's just sterling silver trim, it's not a whole sterling silver pen. It's a little more reasonable, um, but it's $700, so it is quite a bit. Um, but it's 18 karat nib, it's made of celluloid. Of course, I'm digging the blue. Writes like a dream. So it's definitely a worthwhile pen if you're looking at kind of that Visconti uh, Homo Sapiens price range or any of the high-end Pelicans, anything like that. I would strongly urge you consider one of these because it's a pretty decent pen. And we got those now. Um, let's see here, we have some new Monteverde inks that have come in. We're in the process of swabbing those up right now. Some nice colors, the new Monograppa Sapphire, right in that blue that I love so much. So that's a nice one. Um, lots of other cool colors. We got some new Robert Oster colors that are coming as well. Um, Robert Oster is a whole new brand we launched this month, but we have even more colors that are coming. Um, so. Uh, should be kind of exciting there. Um, also, the news is out about the Lamy All-Star Pacific, which is the new special edition All-Star for 2017. That, we are being told, is going to be available in the next couple of weeks. I don't have an exact date yet. I haven't gotten a sample yet, which is why we haven't like put it out there on our social media channels, but um, I'm hoping that we can get a sample soon so that we can do our magic. My team can rock it with the pictures and video, and 
and uh, we can get something out there for you guys to get you all excited about it. But um, we ordered a lot of them, so I do not anticipate it's going to be a sellout right away situation. We're trying to be there to service you guys in that way. Um, but uh, I'm told mid to late February. Actually, I was told mid-February, but just because I haven't heard anything yet, I'm saying mid to late February because I don't know exactly when it's coming. So be on the lookout for that. Um, nice blue color. You know, of course, I love blue. But the, the Ocean Blue All-Star is a nice deep kind of royal blue, which I really love. This one is going to be a lighter blue than that. So I think it's going to be really nice. Um, let's see here. The Monteverde Mountains of the World has come out in two new colors, Everest and Vesuvio. Mount Everest, Mount Vesuvio. Um, so those are pretty cool if you were into that kind of larger pen um, with the big center band on it like the Mountains of the World has. They discontinued two colors and then they um, brought these two new ones in. So it's just kind of a, whew, they're swapping them out, keeping it fresh. Also, Platinum has a 3776 uh, new special edition called the Nice Lilas. And uh, it's lilac in French. Um, and I think I'm not that big into pink pens. But this one looks really good. It's pink with rose gold trim. I think it looks really good. It's a pink demo, and I'm really excited about it. So we should have those. The first, I think, 2,000 of them are going to be numbered. After that, they're just going to be regular, uh, you know, no numbering. So those will be coming, and I don't have an exact date for those yet either, but just wanted to get that on your radar. It's going to be a little bit more than the regular 3776s, just like all their special editions are. And then um, we have the... Visconti Brunelleschi, which I actually have a sample of it here to show you. It comes in this rather large box in this brown kind of velvety bag with the Visconti logo on it. it. Takes me a second to get it out of the bag, so I already took it out for you so you didn't have to watch me struggle. It's got the Visconti logo on the top, kind of nice. And then on the inside, it actually has um, uh, a decorative tile that's going to be on the inside here, but that, that wasn't in the sample. It wasn't ready, so I don't have that to show you. But it is a, um, a new material that they have that is made of basically of terracotta clay, and it's uh, impregnated in resin. So kind of like how the Homo sapiens is, you know, lava rock impregnated in resin to give it strength and not have it be so porous, because if you made a pen just out of regular clay, not only would it probably very, be very brittle, it wouldn't hold water very well. So um, they impregnate it with resin there to give it that. They also have a matching traveling inkwell which is that same terracotta material, which I think is really cool. So that's kind of sweet. And then it comes with a bottle of brown ink in this kind of specially shaped bottle, which is kind of neat. I don't know if the final version of it, it's got the Visconti in the cap, but I don't know if the final version is going to have anything on the actual glass itself. Maybe not. Well, usually when they do ink wells, they don't do any type of like label or anything on there. It's got an eyedropper too, so you can fill your, your traveling ink well. And then the pen itself um, is the oversize one, so if you have the, the larger Visconti Homo sapiens, it's that size. Um, it's got the hook safe lock cap, which I absolutely love. Looks very clean and crisp too. This material just, it cuts into it very nicely. Um, it's a hexagonal shape, sorry, octagonal shape, which I really dig. Um, you don't see that a lot. Very kind, kind of like an Omasi kind of feel, like an homage to the Paragon. Um, but uh, uh, I really, Love this size. I really love the shape. It's very similar in size to the oversized Homo sapiens. The material is actually fairly light, and um, it is uh, fairly hygroscopic, just like the um, the what's it called Homo sapiens is. Uh, maybe a little bit smoother, just a little bit smoother. But again, I haven't had this pen for long, so I don't know if over time it would kind of gloss up and polish up with the oils in your hand. That's definitely the case with the Homo sapiens. Uh, it does that. Mine's done that over the last year and some as I've been carrying it around. It does have the full-size Visconti Dream Touch nib, which is awesome. One of my favorite nibs that you can get. Very wet writing nibs, so uh, I would lean towards the finer sizes if you want to you know, have it uh, on, on more absorbent papers. It's got the engraved, um, they're getting away from doing the enameled, ca uh, you know, clips, the enameled logos in the cap. So what they would do is they would have it inset and then fill with an enameling, but they had a problem with uh, being able to do that uh, very consistently. So sometimes there'd be little pockets inside the enameling and they're getting away from that. So now they're getting more into just etching and engraving into the, into the clip itself, which I'm perfectly fine with. Uh, rose gold trim, a two-tone nib, and then it's got the um, power filler as well. So slightly larger ink capacity than the piston, and uh, it's a really kind of a cool filling mechanism. So um, the pen is definitely more in the kind of like 
you know, exclusive price range. Um, it's an MSRP of $995. Um, of course, you can log into your Gooley Pens account to see what our price is. Uh, spoiler alert, it's a little lower than that. But um, pretty sweet pen. So I know they had a fountain pen network version of this that's slightly different. The trim was different. Um, it came with some different stuff. The setup, the setup was different. Um, so, and that was was a timed exclusive that was available to the Fountain Pen Network Facebook group, I believe. Um, I got to see a little bit of that on there, um, but uh, they are are opening it up to you know worldwide uh, distribution there. So, um, it's a relatively new thing to the world. We'll have it available soon. It's on our site. You can sign up for the email list if you're interested in that. Um, and the last thing that we're going to have that I'll mention right now is um, we're going to be carrying Keras Customs Titanium Nibs. Um, I have nib nooked all of those. They're pretty cool. They're very soft writing. I don't know that I would call them flex nibs because I think flex nib purists may have an issue with that. But um, they're definitely soft writing nibs that can get uh, some line variation. So um, they're definitely interesting to write with. So they have a little bit of feedback to them on the actual grind. You can, of course, you can smooth them out if you are so inclined. Um, but they're very soft, very springy, and you can get a decent amount of spread on those tines, um, which is pretty cool. But you do get a bit of railroading if you push it. And the thing that's different about titanium as opposed to gold or even steel nibs is it doesn't really give you a firm stopping point before it gives out. <laughs> so it's easy to push it too far and then over flex it and spring those tines. So it doesn't really give you a lot of warning before you get to that point. So you have to be very careful, very conscientious when you're using these titanium nibs. Um, so you can check those things out. And I believe they're gonna be in the $60 price range somewhere around there. So not cheap, but not insane either. It's less than you pay to have a nib customized to add flex. So kind of cool. Those are gonna be number six size. They're Bach nibs and they're gonna be number six size. Um, that the threading may not thread into other pens, but you could probably yank the nib and put on some other ones if you felt so inclined. So pretty neat. Um, glad to have those. We've been, been getting asked about those for forever. I think about a year or so we've been getting asked about those and they're just finally coming about. All right, let's jump into the week, shall we? Um, I have pretty much all pen questions this week. Uh, I got a little bit extra, but uh, I'll certainly have a lot of them. So uh, we'll get into it. So this first one is from David J uh, by an email. It says, with all the inks I've already purchased, as well as getting into blending inks for various colors and shades, what is your go-to pen for trying out inks? What do you use to test out new inks in small quantities before you decide to ink up something better? So, you know, first off, I'll say you can really use whatever you want. There's no specific pen that you have to use uh, for trying stuff out. Um, I usually, well, it depends. It depends if I'm doing it purely for the intention of trying out the ink. If I'm excited, I have a new ink and I really want to just get into it, I'll just put it in whatever pen that I like that I kind of regularly use that I have handy that's clean and empty. Um, <laughs> when I'm testing out several inks kind of back to back, um, my go-to is a Lamy, either an All Star or a Vista. Um, and the reason that I like these ones specifically, it's kind of, it's kind of intentional. I'll use the all-star here because it's blue and I like blue. So the thing that I like about it, a couple different things. One is that it has this smoky kind of demonstrator grip section. The reason that I like that is because if I'm testing a small amount of ink, I like being able to use a converter and I suck just a little bit of ink up into here and I only suck up enough to fill the feed. I don't use it so that it fills the converter. And that's intentional because if I'm gonna be cleaning it out and trying something else, I don't want to have to clean out the converter if I don't have to. And if I do it right, I can do it to where I never even get ink into the converter. It only gets in the grip section. So that's one less thing to clean out, which is kind of cool, right? Uh, and then the other thing that I like about it is it's really easy to clean out. So I just use a bulb syringe, which I meant to pull ahead of time, and now I've got to go searching for it. Here we go. Just the blue bulb syringe, one of the best tricks I've ever found in the fountain pen world. Stick it right on there, flush it out. And then that's it. If the converter, I don't even get the converter dirty, literally just take some water, flush it out, take a paper towel, take it to the nib, soak up the excess from the feed. I can put the converter back on and go to my next ink. It's better than just dip testing it because it's actually flowing the ink through the feed. 
and it's very easy to clean out. So I can quickly go on to the next one. Another thing I really like about Lamy's specifically is I have a slew of their nibs and you can just slide them right off. Sometimes it takes a piece of scotch tape or something to it to really get a grip on it. This one is, uh, I've done it a bunch of times, so it, it comes off a little easier now. Um, but I can swap in between nibs, so I can actually keep it inked up, swap the nibs out, you know, go from say a fine to a 1.1 or something like that, and I don't have to change anything and I get a different writing experience just from swapping that nib out. It's also very easy nibs to clean. So that's really pretty cool. I like doing that a lot as well. So um, you can do the same thing with the Vista if you don't have an all-star. The Vista, you know, has a clear grip as well. That's why I specifically point out the Vista. Of course, you can do that with really any pen, but this one is one that I've honed over the years as to being a really good ink testing pen. Of course, you can always use a glass pen. Um, it's a little bit different. They tend to write a little bit wetter and maybe don't have quite as consistent of an experience that the flow and all that won't be the same, but you'll get an idea of what it looks like on the paper. So, and they're super easy to clean. So that's really good. You can also use like regular calligraphy dip pens. Those are a little tougher. Sometimes you have to have an ink reservoir on those before it'll hang on because those are meant for for um, actual calligraphy ink, which is thicker than fountain pen ink. So you have to have some kind of ink reservoir or something on it so that the ink will actually stay on the nib and you can write with it. But I, I've been able to make those work too. Um, I just don't like that quite as much as going with an actual pen. So that's what I uh, tend to lean towards there. And I'm trying to think if I thought of anything last night as I was prepping this. Um, I would say if you, you know, you can, you can test it in whatever pen you want. I would stay away from some of the more complex filling mechanisms like vacuum fillers and, you know, crescent fillers and stuff like that that have bladders and those are not as easy to clean out. And if you're testing ink after ink, you're going to get really sick of cleaning those things out. Um, piston you can do okay, especially if you're only sucking a little bit up in there, but still you got to flush and fill and there's not a really great faster way to clean those things out. Cartridge converter pens tend to be the best for testing a lot of different inks because you can use that bulb syringe. So that's my big, big secret when testing out different inks. Cool, hopefully that helps you out. Take a little sip of tea here. Mm. I've really been getting into tea more lately. I've been trying to lose weight and uh, I have been successfully doing so. I plateaued the last couple of weeks. I'm at about 220 now. I was 235 at the beginning of the year. So I've lost 15 pounds in a month. It's pretty respectable, pretty aggressive uh, diet and exercise regimen routine that I've been on, but uh, not too bad. I'm gonna go ahead and pop a cough drop just preemptively because I don't wanna get into a coughing fit with you guys. When you talk continuously like this for an hour straight, you'd be surprised at how much you can make yourself cough. Anyway. All right, this next question is from Marino, uh, e Marino Burr on YouTube. Uh, sorry about that, I know I botched your name. Uh, what is more important at the beginning? Have a great variety of inks or pens? Okay, I think this is a really great question, especially for you know new people who are getting into fountain pens. Um, a lot of times the pens can be a big draw, right? Like the pens are like the, the car, you know, and the ink is like, I don't know, the paint on the car or something. I don't know, that's a terrible analogy. Don't go with that one, uh, I'm just being honest. So my brain's a little foggy. I'm not at my, my peak today, but you're gonna get it anyway, because this is what we do here. Um, so from my background, I did not have a lot of fountain pen experience um, coming into the fountain pen world. Of course, I thought fountain pens were very appealing, um, but I also had no money. So the idea of buying a $700 pen was, I didn't even want to see it. I was like, I don't even want to hear about this pen because I can't have it. So why do I even want to know about it? Because I just it's just telling me something that I'm gonna get excited about that I can't have. So I never got into any of the expensive pens in the beginning. I would look into things like the Lamy's, like the Lamy All-Stars and Vistas were aspirational for me in the beginning. Um, I think some of the first pens I bought, I bought a Kaweco Classic Sport, I bought a Lamy Joy, it's a Pelican Script. So I was very much shopping in that 10 to $30 price range, pretty hard. Um, of course, the Metropolitan wasn't back out back then when I first got into it. Otherwise, you can believe I would have gotten all over that one. Um, but I, I was able to get a good writing experience um, from a few different pens. And I bought you know three to five pens and I was pretty happy with what I had at the time. But the ink, 
was really what got me excited. And honestly, that's that's you know important part of Goulet history here. We didn't sell fountain pens for the first year of our business. Only sold ink and paper, strictly for fountain pens. But we didn't sell any pens. Um, part of that was because I had been making my own pens and I transitioned out of that. But a lot of it was I was still new to the hobby. I didn't have a lot of money to invest in the business and I didn't have uh, a breadth of experience in fountain pens themselves. So in order to learn my way into the hobby, I learned paper and ink. So I guess the answer to this question would be, I think ink is the better way to go because that's what I did. So I guess I would be a hypocrite if I said anything else, but it's gonna be different for everybody. You could be coming from a different place. You know, if you have more experience with pens or if you have some nicer fountain pens that were passed on to you, you know, maybe you're not a 25 year old with a kid who's trying to get his business off the ground after three years of having no income, that would probably put you in a different position than I was in. <laughs> maybe you'd have, maybe you could afford like more than a $20 pen ever and you could get into some pens before you get into inks. But the thing that I liked about inks personally was I found that if you had a pen that you liked well enough, you know, a pen is a pen is a pen, right? That's why I have 500 of them. But you know, a pen will write and it'll do different things and yes, but a pen is a vehicle, really. It's the ink on the page that is kind of the mark that's left behind. And there's a lot of different types of pens for sure and you can get different writing experiences with them. Um, but the ink I found is the best bang for the buck in terms of changing up your writing experience. You know, for example, like I'll use Lamy as an example. It's a relatively inexpensive pen. I can get a different nib and get a different writing experience with that Lamy, but that nib is gonna cost me $13.50. That's a whole bottle of ink. Or if I go ink samples, I can get like 10 or 11 ink samples for the cost of that nib, just the replacement nib. So I can really get a wide writing experience with a limited selection of pens and a wider range of inks. And you know, you can, even if you're just sticking with ink samples, unless you're writing a lot, ink samples will go a pretty decent mileage, right? So I, th what I kind of like to ascribe to is you get a, f a few reliable pens. This is why I talk about like fountain pens for newbies like the Metropolitan, the Safari, Gin House, you know, things like that that are relatively inexpensive. You get a couple of those if you're really if you're really kind of wanting to get into the hobby. If you're very passive and like not even sure if fountain pens are for me, get one pen, one ink, use the cartridge that comes with the pen, whatever, and just try it or just borrow it from somebody you know that uses fountain pens. Don't dive deep into it. But if you're like pretty sold on it and you know you want to get into it kind of for the long term, get, you know, three to five pens that are pretty good. You know, solid value that you like and you want to carry around. And then I would, I would then pause a bit on the pens and get into ink because you can get a wide variety of ink, different colors, different brands. You can try samples. There's different properties you can get into. You can get into permanent, fast drying, UV, all kinds of different aspects of ink. You can get shimmering inks. You know, there's all kinds of things you can experiment with, with ink. And then that you can, and then you can take the ink and different inks will perform differently in different pens. And then the color looks different depending on the nib size that you're writing with. And there's a lot of experience that you can gain with fountain pens just by trying a lot of different inks. So that's what I found. And I really didn't experiment much with pens that first kind of that first year that I was into fountain pens, even as a retailer, because I didn't sell them. I was doing paper, ink. I was just really trying to learn those. Then once I started getting into pens, okay, it started to take on. I think if you try and get a lot of both pens and inks at the same time, it can be a little overwhelming. You know, it's kind of good. Most people I know too will get a bunch of pens and kind of limit their ink and just, you know, do with pens and just use the same inks that they like in the pens. Or they'll have a limited selection of pens and they'll get go crazy on the inks unless they're just really out of control. Like me. And they go full bore on both eventually. But to do that from the get-go is pretty overwhelming. It's nice to pick kind of one avenue. And the ink is a more affordable way to go, so I would kind of lean that way because you can get, you can extend your experience out a little further. Unless you've got the means, then what the heck, go for the pens. Um, but I think if you go maybe three to five pens that are pretty decent, and then you get into inks, especially samples, full bottles, you can do that, but I would only commit full bottles for things that you really kind of know that you want. Go samples, which is why I started the whole sampling thing. Um, Rachel and I, back in the day, I wanted to try a bunch of inks, and even as a retailer buying them wholesale, I was like, I can't afford all these different models. 
So I, we started samples. That's a lot of why I was like, if I want to try samples, I'm sure other people do too. Boom, samples. Um, so I would say probably get like 20 to 40 samples. You know, that's a lot of ink. It's a lot of ink for sure. It's a lot of cleaning out your pens and stuff, but of course now you know how to do that. Um, but uh, try 20 to 40 samples or so, and then you'll start to learn what you really like. Colors that you really like, certain colors that really blow your mind, you want to get full bottles of them, great. Ones that perform really well in all the different pens you have. And then you can kind of swing back towards pens and focusing on kind of getting into some of the next level pens. And then getting into the next level pens with inks that you've now kind of narrowed down that you know you really like, then it starts to get really fun. You start to really feel like you're getting somewhere, you're honing in on what it is that you really like, that you really connect with, that fits your writing style. And then, you know, that's that's probably about the first year. For, for most people, I would say, that's about the first year of your writing experience. And you know, six to 12 months, something like that. Now, these are all general timelines, but I think that's a pretty good progression right there. It's not too aggressive. You get to spend enough time with every ink, with every pen, to really get to know what you like. And then you can kind of go nuts from there. Um, me personally, I focused on the inks for about the first year, and then I started getting into pens. And then I would kind of swing back and forth between pens and ink, and now it's kind of both. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's, my, that's my recommendation for you if you're just getting into it. All right, Carl K on Facebook asks, Brian, do you have any tips on how I might keep three to four pens in rotation enough to prevent them from clogging up due to disuse? I have three in my Knock Sinclair pouch and at least one in my shirt pocket at all times. Uh, I think three to four, Carl, is actually a pretty great number. Um, I think that's very manageable, especially if you're writing something every day. I personally, at bare minimum, will have three to four pens inked up. I think right now I'm actually pretty okay. Well, I have I probably about eight, nine pens at home that I need to clean out but they're just kind of like off to the side. Um, so I guess those would be considered inked up. But I have like probably five pens right now that are actually inked up. I could pick one up and use right now. And actually, there's probably more than that. There's a couple over there. Okay, I've got like 20 pens that are inked up right now because I'm like cutting out all these ones. I'm like, well, those ones are around my desk. They don't count. I guess they do. Never mind. I have a problem. But uh, I think three to four is, is actually a pretty great number, you know, because most pens, most pens and most inks in most normal conditions, you know, if you're in a more arid, humid, more arid, dry climate, your pens are going to dry a little faster than if you're in a humid climate. Um, you know, especially if it's colder, it tends to be a little drier or really hot in like a desert type situation, your pens can dry a little quicker, but generally you're going to get several weeks before your pens start to have much of an effect from kind of drying out. Certain inks can certainly accelerate that um, if they tend to write a little more dry. Um, certain pens maybe don't seal as well, so this is all very generalized, but I would say most pens, you can easily go two, three, four weeks without using them and they can write without much trouble, you know, um, you know, just picking them up and writing with them. So I don't know that you need to really do anything special if you're carrying around three to four pens other than just kind of mix them up a little bit. Even if you write with it once a week, then you should be okay. That should be enough to kind of keep it going. If you do find that your pen has dried up a little bit, like usually what's going to happen, it's going to dry up on the nib and then the ink inside will still be fine. You know, you'll have a little, you know, maybe have a converter or something like that, and then you'll have the nib that's dried out a little bit if you haven't used it for a few weeks. Getting that started again is not, not very difficult, um, especially if you have a converter. All you gotta do is just take the converter and just push it down a little bit. Just go down and up a little bit at a time as that ink kind of goes down, and you're gonna be able to work it down there, saturate that, ooh, shoot, I just dropped it right on my desk. <laughs> Well, there you go. Now my pen is saturated again. Um, maybe don't do that right on your desk. I'm glad my computer wasn't there. Sheesh. Anyway, you'd think I'd know better by now. Now my feet is saturated and I'm gonna be good to go. Um, another thing that you can do is if you have a little cup of water or if you're at the sink or something, you gotta be careful of the sink because it could splash, but um, just getting it wet will get it flowing again. Of course, if, it, if you get it wet, you know, wipe it off with a towel or something because it'll be a little desaturated at that point because you're putting straight water on there. Um, but you're gonna be able to jumpstart your pen pretty easily just by doing that. Um, some people I have heard, I've never done this myself, but they'll actually lick the tip um, to get it started again. I don't recommend doing that, but that's 
reinforces the concept of getting it wet again. Um, so that's what I would do. So there's so all these different ways to jump start your pen in maybe five or ten seconds, even if you do get in that situation. But if you get in the start where you start carrying around like eight, ten pens at a time, then you really have to be more careful and intentionally kind of write, write with a different pen every day on purpose kind of thing. But if it's three to four, I don't know that you really need to do anything too crazy. Um, one thing that you can do to help yourself out a little bit in terms of making sure that you want to rotate them is putting different color inks that you know you like in each of the pens. That way, if you're like me and you write with one ink for like a couple of days, you're like, nah, I kind of want something different. Then you can pull out the next pen and be like, ooh, this ink is cool. You know, or if you're writing and you're taking notes in a book or something and you want different colors, you're more inclined to naturally want to switch colors in those pens anyway. Um, and then the last thing is just kind of the way that you store them or maybe carry them around. If you are storing them in kind of the longer term nib up, I find that they tend to dry out a little sooner than if you have them horizontally or nib down. If you're carrying them around, you got to be careful about having them like nib down or horizontal because you can, you know, shake it and force ink out into your cap which could then accelerate the drying out process. So uh, it's actually a little better to have them nib up if you're carrying them around. So all these are all things, and every pen's gonna be a little bit different. Some pens like to be nib up and sideways, you know, whatever, uh, a little bit different. You gotta learn your pens um, over time, but that generally will get you uh, pretty far along the way. All right? Next question, this is from Spunkmeyer on Instagram. In previous videos, you said, you should put ink away in the box it came in or in a drawer to keep the ink from breaking down. If I have a demonstrator like the Twisby Eco, should I do the same or is it perfectly fine to keep it on my desk? It's a really good question. So um, I have talked about that before. If you have a bottle of ink uh, like I have here, you're probably familiar with what a bottle of ink looks like, but I'm gonna show you anyway. I have a bottle of Dimene Marine, one of my favorite inks. So. The bottle itself is just glass. It's just clear glass, that's all it is. Um, and so if I have this thing sitting on my windowsill and UV light is just bashing this thing all day long, eventually that UV light is going to break down the dyes in the ink. It's not going to be as vibrant. The color is not gonna last as long. This is not gonna be as good because these dyes that are used in these inks are particularly not spectacular at UV resistance. Now, some inks are better than others. There's definitely some like Noodler's fade resistant inks and archival inks and stuff like that that will do a better job of that. Even still, it's not a great idea because then you, you know, if it's sitting in the sunlight all day, it can also heat up and be more likely to cause mold growth and stuff like that. So in general, you wanna keep it in a cool, dark place. Even just if it's in the box, that helps a lot because you don't have the UV thing happening there. So theoretically, yes, the same concept could be possible in a pen. The thing is though, if you think about the ink that's in a pen, you know, I'm talking like maybe a milliliter or a little bit more in a pen like this, how long is that really likely to hang around inside this pen? You know, a week, a couple of weeks, something like that. Yes, theoretically, if you're leaving this pen in, if you're leaving the ink in here for months and it's sitting in the sun and just beating down on it, it's gonna maybe break down the ink a little bit. But if that's the case, you're not using that pen much anyway. <laughs> so who really cares? Just dump the ink and put new ink in there. It's not that much anyway. So it's really only an issue with the bottle because you don't want to ruin a whole bottle of your ink by leaving it out there. That said, I don't have like a lot of specific scientific kind of evidence that's been, or not scientific, but um, practical evidence, I guess, where people have left their ink bottle out in direct UV and said, well, it caused my ink to be 37% less whatever, fade resistant or something like that. I just know that, that conceptually that's that's you know something to watch out for. Um, but it's not a widespread issue that I have people complaining to me all the time. I think as most people generally are taking care of their inks and it's not a real problem. Um, so in a pen, it's such a small volume of ink. Honestly, I think if you're gonna be leaving it in direct sunlight for months at a time, you'd probably be more concerned about the health of your pen than about the few cents worth of ink that's actually in the pen. So that's really what I would say. Um, just, you know, in general, it's not the greatest idea to leave your pens out in direct sunlight, um, but you don't need to go to the lengths of keeping them stored away in a drawer inside a thing all the time. I leave my pens out on my desk 
and don't think twice about it. And I suggest you do the same. Cool? This next question is from MNML Scholar on Instagram. Minimal Scholar, just got that. Minimal Scholar on Instagram. I've been told that some pens perform better with some inks than others, perhaps. But I've also been told that quality pens will work with any ink, which is the case in your experience. Yes, so um, there's definitely the case that finely tuned pens, and I mean like properly tuned pens, which could be in any price range. You can certainly buy expensive pens, pens that are not tuned properly. So it's not just a matter of price, but properly tuned pens, which is what you're kind of referring to here as quality, um, will perform generally well with any ink. That is, that is true. If you have a pen that's maybe not tuned perfectly, you have a wetter, more lubricated ink, or just the ink likes the pen better, it can make up for some of those things. You know, I'm thinking particularly a pen that writes really dry, if you use a lubricated ink in there, it can help to write, make it write better. So you can sort of accommodate for improper tuning with ink. It doesn't even have to be improper tuning, it could just be tuning that's not as much to your liking. Like maybe some nibs are tuned you know, uh, a little tighter because they're springier. And most people when they're writing with a heavier hand would spring them out and have that flow coming through. Whereas if you have a really light touch or you hold your pen at a really high angle, maybe it's just not as ideally tuned for your handwriting. There's definitely an element of person personality here. Um, but that said, um, I think that, uh, that the most important thing here is that the ink and the way that it performs in your pen can vary in a pen of any price range or quality range. Um, I don't think that you need to necessarily try to fix or adjust for or tune your writing experience quite as much with a properly tuned pen because it will generally write okay. You know, if it's not going to skip and it's not going to um, have starting issues and stuff like that, there's not as much of a need to try to find a particular, you know, type of ink to accommodate for that like you would on a pen that is more prone to do those types of things. Um, but you certainly can get inks that have varying properties in the pen because depending on the nib size, depending on how the, the design of the feed and how wet it writes and all that, your ink can certainly shade more. It can look darker or lighter. It can dry in different time frames. It can have different amounts of sheen or shimmer to them. Um, all of these things can be impacted based on the pen that they're in. So you can have one pen, even if it writes really well, that you might like to write with a different type of ink just because it flows better or it dries faster, you know? So there's, there's all kinds of ways you can still kind of fine tune your experience, even though you're not trying to fix a quality issue on the pen. Does that make sense? So um, a lot of it's gonna boil down to personal preference and what it is that you're trying to do with that pen. It's really just amazing to me how, even just between my wife and I, we can literally, we'll both take the same pen, ink, and paper, exact same setup. And she holds her pen at a higher angle. She has a four finger grip, which I just don't understand how that works, even after all these years. And she'll write with it and she does not use a lot of pressure. She writes at a very steep angle and she writes pretty quickly. So she doesn't put down as much ink. I write a little slower, I have a heavier hand and I drop that pen angle down really low. I just have a very low angle because I have very long fingers. So, you know, it just doesn't, you know, when I'm writing with my pen, it's not unusual for me to have, you know, my pen angle, you know, about here you know, 45, somewhere somewhere right about there, 40 to 45. When she writes, she writes more like this. Like it's much steeper and I'm trying to write with four fingers and I, I can't even, I just can't even. <laughs> she does something like this. And that pen, because the way she holds it, that pen is like way up there. So it looks completely different. The line width is different. The amount of shading is different. It's more with mine. You know, the, the hue, the saturation is different with the exact same setup. It's unbelievable how different it is just because of the person that's writing it. So that's part of the beauty and the curse with all this stuff is I could get a scientific all day long to tell you exactly how it should be based on the different components it has, but it's part science and part art. And the art is how you are writing with it. So even if you have one pen and a variety of inks and all these things and you're trying, 
you're going to have a unique experience based on you with all this. So a lot of it's going to come down to personal preference. Um, but the short answer is, even if you're getting a quality pen, you can still tweak that experience with a lot of different inks. All right, let's get away a little bit from some ink and pens, shall we? I got a paper question for you. And it's a good one. This is from Book Addict Katie on Instagram. Hi, Katie. Will you have the Leuchtturm 1917 Anniversary Edition notebooks in stock? The short answer is yes. The not quite as short answer is when are we going to have them? So um, long story short, there's going to be a shortage of these things in the United States at least. I don't know about globally, but I have been forewarned by our Leuchtturm distributor that we are going to be shorted. I don't know to what degree, but I know it's going to be ugly. It's, they're going to start to be available worldwide, and the U.S. is just not getting nearly enough of these things. So it's going to be a little chaotic because I think the notebooks are going to be really hot. We ordered a ton of them. Actually, a couple of tons of them, if you weigh them out. We ordered a lot of these, a lot of these notebooks, and we're just not going to get them for a while. So that's a little frustrating, but I think we've had to come to accept it. I have to get you all to accept it. This is not a lot I can do about it. I can't force these things to come. You know, we deal with suppliers. They're made by Leuchtturm in Germany. You know, they have distributors all over the world. For whatever reason, I don't know all the details, but the U.S. is just getting a very limited supply. I don't know if it's a limited supply worldwide. It may be. Um, but I know that um, there's going to be a trickling of notebooks that are going to come out in the next month or two. I don't know exactly when. Um, and then I'm told the next batch is not going to come until July. And I'm sorry, it's going to be July. Or later. It could always come later. I don't know. When dates like this come, it's, it's always so up in the air. I am told we're going to get our order in full in July. But I don't know if that's going to happen. This is too far out. So I know it's going to be kind of a disaster. I don't even know if we're going to get any notebooks to sell at all. But I know if we do, it's not nearly going to be enough. So basically, don't even count on it. It's not, it's not just us. It's going to be pretty much every U.S. retailer, uh, from what I understand, is going to be severely shorted. So these things are going to be, they're going to come, they're going to be available for like a second, and then you're not going to be able to find them until July. So that really stinks. And there's just no way to sugarcoat it. I, have, I don't know all the details why, um, but I know that's the situation that we're facing. So as much as it stinks, we're, we're still going to talk about it a little bit. Um, but I'm not going to promote these things very heavily right now because we're not going to have any notebooks to sell. So, and that would just make a lot of people mad because they're, they're really exciting and a lot of people want to see these sweet metallic notebooks, but I'm just not going to have any. So, that said, um, we're still going to put them up on our site eventually. Um, we don't even have any right now. I'm hoping we can get some to at least photograph. <laughs> um, but we are going to um, you know, get them on our site so that when the time comes in July, you can be email notified as to exactly when they come. And I think once we know that they are actually coming, we're going to look to promote them and stuff like that. So we're going to try to like, you know, do our own thing on them, maybe get them in the hands of some bloggers and stuff if we can um, in due time. But it's just not going to be a big push for these in the near term because we're not going to have any notebooks. So um, once I get them in person, maybe I can show it off. Maybe I'll show it off in a little Q&A. But it's, we're going to be we're going to be a little quiet about it just because um, we don't want to make everybody all mad that we don't have notebooks. And that's where we're at. That's how it goes sometimes in the fountain pen and notebook retailing world. Sometimes we get shorted on stock and we can't do anything about it. But it'll come all in due time, all in due time. Next question. This is troubleshooting from Nicholas Cruz on Instagram. Nicholas asks, I get a lot of condensation in my Twisby cap. Is that from temperature change or something else? Is there a way to stop it? So I have a Twisby Eco. I don't know if that's what you're dealing with, but that's what I have in my possession. A lot of the Twisby pens, you know, have, you know, clear caps. So you could be talking about anything. Um, this condensation that you're talking about happens 
on a lot of different pens. It is not anything specific to the Twisby. Um, temperature change could be a part of it, um, but really what's happening is you have a pen that is filled with ink, you have a nib, which is for all intents and purposes open to the atmosphere, and you're taking it and putting it inside a cap and you're sealing it off. So all the ink that's in here, it's evaporating, the water is evaporating out of the ink, and it wants to go somewhere. You know, you have a very wet, moist environment inside the bottom of your pen, very arid, dry environment up here in your cap, and it wants to equalize. So what happens, the water vapor kind of, you know, water evaporates out of the, the ink, and it just hangs out and it clings to the side of the cap. And that's it, it'll do it to a point and then it'll stop because it'll equalize and that's about all you got. Um, but, you know, especially if you're carrying the pen around, you can get little drips of ink and stuff like that that'll get in there. This is my Pilot Custom 74, my personal one, and let me try to zoom in here, see if I can show you what's going on. But I definitely have some, some pretty serious, it's kind of dark, isn't it? Hmm. It's kind of hard to see. But I'll see if I can show you kind of what I've got going on here. A little bit. Uh, kind of, you can kind of see it in there. Maybe not. Ha. Huh. Let me see if I can use my, uh, I've never tried this before, LED on my phone. There we go. Oh, yeah. You see that ink in there? Some condensation up in here. Yes. So, it's not uncommon. That's not a Twisby. I have a Conklin as well. This one has got some pretty serious uh, condensation stuff going on here. I don't even know if I need the light for that one. Look at that. It's just like straight up water in the cap there. So it's not unusual at all. Oh boy, that's like too much. No. Woo! Sorry, blinding you. All right. So it's not unusual at all. It actually happens on all kinds of pens, not even just clear pens. Oh, how about I zoom out so you can see more than my mouth. It happens on all kinds of pens. It's not anything to sweat too much. It's not really hurting anything. Um, is there anything you can do to prevent it? Not really. If there is, I haven't discovered it. So I don't know that there is. I wouldn't really sweat it too much. Um, it's just kind of how it is. It's definitely higher maintenance to have a perfectly clear and nice looking demonstrator <laughs> because you're dealing with ink and it's just gonna get places. Um, the one thing I will say about the Twisby pens, it's really nice. This is an Eco but um, this works for all the other Twisbees too. If you take a pencil and you wrap a rubber band over the edge of it like this, like take the rubber band kind of long ways and wrap it across the end of the pencil and you can stick it inside your cap into that cap insert and the thing will pop right out. And then you can get in there and you can clean it out really thoroughly. Um, just, you know, a Q-tip, get in there Wet the Q-tip a little bit sometimes will help too, because otherwise you might just smear the ink around. You can clean out the inside of the insert. You don't even have to take the insert out if you don't want to. Um, now I'm going to put it back in there. With the Eco, it's got like this little notch in here. It's got a fitter on the, the clip hold. There we go. Beautiful. Um, but a Q-tip, most of the time, you just swab it out, and then you're good to go and you're good for a few days. It's not the end of the world. But I understand, you know, some people get really particular when it comes to keeping their demonstrators looking really perfect, and that's fine. Um, you just gotta do a little maintenance to make that happen. You know, you're carrying it around, it's a wet environment in there, and you're just gonna get some condensation. So, that's pretty much what I have to say about that. Last question I have for this week is from Julie V. G. on YouTube. Now that you're bigger in the business, do you still actively seek new products to carry or do you just go with whatever manufacturers contact you? Um, that's a good question. So it's kind of a combination of the two. So um, the manufacturers that we get contacted from the most are the ones who are already doing business with. You know, for example, uh, Lamy. Lamy, they come out with new pens. Lately, they've been coming out with new pens every year, multiple pens every year. It's been great. Um, we all love it, we all get excited. So we have a good relationship with a rep that we have that works at Lamy, and uh, they tell us, hey, this new pen, Lamy Pacific, is coming out. It's pretty exciting. When's it coming, blah, 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 blah. We start that whole conversation. Um, that's pretty easy because we know that everybody's gonna want that one. Um, it's a little more difficult when we get, uh, you know, for example, Monograppa. Use Monograppa as an example. So they have a lot of pens, a lot of more high-end, limited edition pens, ones that we aren't quite selling as regularly yet. 
Um, so when they come out with a pen like the Passione, they gave this to me, um, samples of this, back in November when it first came out. Um, and at the time, we were completely booked for the holidays. We had no time to spare. And as much as I loved the pen, the rest of the team was like, I don't know that we have the time to devote to showing off this beautiful pen. And so I said, okay, we'll wait. And so we waited until things calmed down for us and then we came up with the pen. So, um, you know, that kind of situation was one where they were like, hey, we think you would be good to sell this pen. Are you interested in it? And so on and so forth. And we get all kinds of other requests from our regular brands. You know, there's a lot of pens that they offer that we don't carry, not just Monograppa, but you know, everybody. Lamy we carry pretty extensively, but there's some, you know, Pilot we carry most of their line, but a lot of the other brands, they have models and colors and nib sizes and stuff that we don't carry. So a lot of times we'll get asked, hey, do you guys want to carry this? You know, maybe next time we visit, we can show you and yada, yada, yada. And that's always cool. And we like to know what's going on, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going we're gonna to sell it. Um, so there's definitely that kind of ongoing conversation that happens. Um, and then the other situation is we get contacted from people that we don't previously have a business relationship with. Um, you know, for example, uh, Knock, you know, before we were carrying Knock or Keras Customs or Tactile Turn or any of the brands that we, you know, have started to carry and it's like a whole new brand. Um, you know, when we first made contact with Knock, um, we were aware of them for a while. Customers were asking us for them like crazy. So um, I think we actually approached them first and we're like, hey, our customer is asking about it like crazy. Are you guys ever going to retail your stuff instead of selling direct? This was like two years ago. And uh, they were like, yeah, I think we might be interested in that. We're not sure. We're not quite ready, yada, yada, yada. So we kind of kept that conversation going for a long time. And then eventually, when they became ready, great, ready to rock and roll. Um, other things are, are a little more speculative and we hang on to for a while. And you know, I do get asked, I've talked a couple of Q and A's ago about you know, getting asked about some pretty wild and crazy things. Um, independent retail, you know, independent manufacturers will ask about us wanting to sell their stuff. That's a little more difficult, especially if there's not a brand built up around it, not a lot of awareness on it. That gets a little more challenging. Um, but um, those are all instances of kind of us being contacted. Um, the other side of it is when we are interested in carrying something, which really pretty much comes from your interest that you contact us, whether it's my customer care team, you mentioned it on any of our social media channels, um, maybe comments on YouTube, you know, something like that. You're like, hey, you guys should carry bleh, whatever it is. Um, Knock is a good example of that, actually. You know, Knock was making their stuff directly, and you guys were asking us, like, hey, when are you going to sell Knock? Can I get a Knock case from you? Da -da 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 -da. And we're like, what the heck is Knock? <laughs> we had to go look it up. Well, what is Knock? And then we looked, and it's like, oh, Knock is okay. And then we start to research it, and then we might contact them and all that. So um, I know I kind of used Knock under the previous example, but probably should have used it under this one. But, you know, there's certain things like that that are more, I'll call it more organic, where it's, you know, you guys hear about something before us, and then you ask us, and then we go and pursue it. That's, that's like the best of all situations, honestly, because you are telling us what you want. And that gets to like the very spirit and the very like essence of what started this company is I was trying to learn about fountain pens and ink and paper and all that kind of stuff. And I literally would go out on the forums and stuff and be like, what is this stuff? Like, what paper do you guys want? What ink do you even use? What's good? Where do you find it? And just asked a zillion questions. And everybody would respond, be like, oh man, it'd be so great if you carried Clairefontaine Triumph. That's one of my biggest success stories. Clairefontaine Triumph. This was like the first month I was selling fountain pen stuff. Rachel and I had carried a selection of things based off of what Exaclair, who was our first distributor, you know, they, they carry Jerbon, Clairefontaine, Rodia, Excompta, Browse, Cobatis. Um, and so they, they had told us when we first linked up with them, hey, these are some of our more popular products because they have a catalog with like 5,000 products in it. They were like, hey, these are some of our more popular products for fountain pen people. Maybe you want to consider carrying these ones first. We had like no money. So we were like, okay, we'll carry these most popular ones. And we started to carry them. And then we started on the, the, the forums and stuff. We were like, what, what paper do you guys really want that you can't get? And Clairefontaine Triumph came up, right? So Clairefontaine Triumph is a stationary paper. It's just white paper. It's not a lot of versions of it. There's a blank and a lined version. This is the lined one. Super smooth paper. Writes like a dream. Friggin' love it. It's like one of my favorite papers of all time. Um, but it was not readily available. 
very kind of a niche thing. And so people were asking us for it. And we were like, all right, we'll carry Triumph. And I got it. And I was like, oh my gosh, this paper is amazing. So then we've been carrying Clairefontaine Triumph now for over seven years. And it's a very popular product. You know, a lot of people wanted it and used it and then talked about it and kept using it. And so that's a really good success for you, a story of like, you know, something that we pursued, you know, based off of your feedback. A lot of times it's either coming from your feedback or it's coming from us just kind of being on social media or just being aware of what's going on in the community and we'll find something and we're like, ooh, people are gonna like that. But social media moves so fast these days, you know, that it's pretty rare that we discover something that doesn't already have some awareness about it. Unless it's something that's coming down from a, an existing manufacturer that we have a relationship with that's secret. You know, then something like Alami, you know, color or something that is not public yet would be something where it's like, oh, we know people are gonna want that. They don't know about it yet. That's why we're not getting asked about it. But other times things get leaked, you know, color, colors of previous editions have gotten leaked and then, excuse me, whew, and then we get asked about it like crazy and we don't have answers for when it's coming and then it's really frustrating. Anyway, so it's a nice blend between the two, but um, there's a lot of intentional, a lot of very intentional conversation about what new products we should carry around here um, because it says in our mission statement, products we believe in. That's a really important part of the vetting process for products that we want to carry. And we bump up against that too, even with existing products that we're carrying. Just this week, I won't say who, but we had a, a quality issue that we've been dealing with that mainly we've insulated all of our customers from. A lot of times when we discover a quality issue, we will go and search all the products on the shelf just to make sure that we're not actually shipping out products with that quality issue. And this happens with a lot of different brands. But we had one in particular where it's been kind of a thing that's been ongoing a little bit. And so we actually called the rep in and said, look, you gotta see this stuff for yourself. This stuff is just not up to par for what customers should expect. And he was like, you're right, we gotta fix this. So, you know, we, we get into that situation from time to time. Um, how did I even get onto that? <laughs> Yeah, so there's a lot of intentional conversation about not only what new products we should carry, but about what existing products we should continue to carry because of that whole thing of products we believe in. We take that really seriously around here. Um, and you, you know, I get called out on it sometimes. You know, customers will, you know, email me or, you know, talk to my team or something and be like, why are you guys even selling this thing? I thought you believed in your product. And it's just like, dagger in the heart, you know? And a lot of times it's like something, it's, just, it's an exception and there's always gonna be a small percentage of things that are gonna be defect or something like that. And usually we'll work through that, but certainly we, we take that into consideration like very seriously with the stuff that we carry. Um, you know, so there are, um, let's see here. I had made some notes here. Um, you know, there's definitely like some brands that we pursue, especially ones that aren't staples in the fountain pen world. Um, things like sealing wax, like Atelier Gargoyle sealing wax or Curse of Logic when that kind of first came out. Um, a lot of notebook brands, they might be kind of tangential to the fountain pen world, you know, kind of overlap a little bit. If it's a Venn diagram, you know, it's a little sliver that overlaps, but it's not as much of a foothold as a new Lamy All-Star or Safari color. You know, those are very obvious. A new Noodler's color that comes out obviously, Edelstein Ink of the Year, whatever. You know, that's all very pivotal, like obvious, we're gonna carry that. But a lot of other times it's like not quite as obvious, you know? So we have to go and pursue that stuff a little more just because the people that are looking for, you know, certain things, Leuchtturm now, now is much more known in the fountain pen community. Two and a half years ago, when we first started carrying Leuchtturm, no one really knew about it and we pursued it. And so we thought it would be something that would be good for the fountain pen community and we had a bit of foresight on that. It really has caught steam in the last year. But um, you know, new Leuchtturm products that came out two and a half years ago, we would not be getting asked about them. Now, even in this very Q&A, we are. So things change, so we have to, we have to kind of keep that on our radar. Um, the brands we regularly carry, you know, um, we're much more aware of that stuff. New, new stuff from Pilot and Lamy and Noodlers and all that. Um, our, our bigger brands, Visconti, things like that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be up on those pretty, pretty much already. Um, 
so a lot of times, so I'll talk to you about, a little bit about what our process is when we have new products that we're considering, because I think it's pretty interesting. And, um, it's kind of more involved than you probably even realize. It's not just me and Rachel are like, oh, this is fun. Let's do this. Even for something like the Passione, we're like, I really, I really kind of wanted to carry this pen. Um, I still have to kind of vet it through other people because it's not, we're not the sole decision makers anymore. That's part of having a company with, you know, 40 people in it. And you make sure that you don't dictate things that happen. There has to be some consensus and checks and balances and sometimes, you know. Um, so when uh, we're considering new products, so we, we have uh, a structure in place for that. So we have weekly meetings um, that are, you know, new product meetings. Um, that are, you know, cross-functional teams, if you will. So we have people representing from media, customer care, um, myself, Rachel, our inventory team, really a lot of representation from the whole company when we're looking to carry any new product. Um, there's a lot of different factors that go into it. What's the price? How many do you think we're gonna sell? What's the timing? When's it coming out? Is, what's, is it different enough? Is it unique? Is there demand? Are there any expected quality issues? Yada, 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 yada. Are there supply issues that we're expecting? You know, what else is going on in the company? Can we handle it? What's our workload? What's our cash position? All these things are talked about when we're talking about new products. Um, it's not simply, oh, there's a new pen. Of course, we're going to carry it, um, especially because we run our company with no debt. So we're not out there just like, oh, extend the credit line. Sure, whatever. We'll get 10,000 pens. No problem. It's literally like, no, if we want to get this, we're going to have to give something else up. So it's got to be really important, you know? So. A lot of times time is our constraint, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's, you know, other things. Um, but all that comes into conversation in those weekly meetings. Um, and then a lot of times we'll try to get samples ahead of time, you know. Um, for example, I got the Brunelleschi right here. Um, the Visconti Brunelleschi, that's a sample that we got. We haven't gotten the official pens yet, but I got a sample. On Passione, we got samples ahead of time. A lot of these will get samples. And, you know, if it's a new color of a pen like a Lamy Safari or an All-Star, it's like, I know how that pen's going to perform. It's just a new color. Other things, if it's a whole new pen like the Passione, it's like, all right, it says celluloid, sterling silver, what is it actually? You know, I need to hold it in my hand. And I get it in my hand, I'm like, ooh, yeah. Then I get excited about it, the team gets excited about it. So I'll look at it, the team will look at it, we'll pass it around, it'll be right with it, we'll get, we'll kind of like see, have it pass a litmus test within our company. If like, if we can get excited about it, that's a really good sign. If we get in, we're kind of like, eh, I don't really know. It's not really for me. And that might be a couple of people might be like, nah, this Passion really isn't for me. And other people are like, oh my gosh. You know, that's a good sign. The oh my gosh factor. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll kind of pass it around, test it out, kind of see how everybody feels. Um, we also have a uh, Slack channel. So we use Slack inside our company. Um, we have a Slack channel for new product suggestions. So especially our customer care, um, Really, anybody on our team can add on there, but customer care uh, and media, especially because they're the ones talking to you guys the most. Um, we will have a channel where everybody will just put down what's being recommended. And the nice thing about that is, you know, between those two teams and you know other various people, we might have 20 people that are talking to customers on a daily basis and getting all kinds of recommendations. So they're kind of vetting and seeing what's good, and we can kind of see if there's trends of things that are being talked about across the whole company. Um, so that's really nice. It can get things on our radar that maybe would fly off otherwise. Or if we put something on there and be like, oh man, people are crazy over this, and be like, no, other people are like, blah, 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 no. And then we can kind of like vet it a little bit there before we even get further down the road. Um, so that's kind of cool. You know, we have a lot of ways that we, uh, we talk about that stuff. And of course, we're talking about fountain pen stuff all the time around here anyways. It's kind of in our lingo. Um, so between, you know, the Slack channel that we keep here, being in touch with you guys every single day on all these different places, having internal meetings, communication about it, um, and then having regular contact with our sales reps and people who are uh, representing the brands that we have. Um, it keeps us pretty tight in, in with the new products that are coming out. Um, and then, um, yeah, then just, you know, other things that we might happen to stumble across, you know, Kickstarters or uh, other things like that that might be a little more on the fringes We'll just kind of explore, you know, through our own, just kind of searching through social media, and we might put kind of feelers out there um, just about things. You know, well, um, you know, Tactile Turn and Keras Customs was that way. Uh, Knock was that way. They started selling just initially, and it was like, hey, if you guys are interested in the future to sell these things, let us know. 
and you know, a year or two goes by, and then they get to that point, and great, it works out. Um, so we're always kind of have our, our radar up about new products. Um, but to answer your question in one sentence, um, we do it all. We do it all because we love new products and we want to carry the best stuff for you guys. So we'll pursue it in whatever way we can. Cool? All right. Question of the week for this week. Um, this has to do with uh, being new into the fountain pen hobby. So I've kind of told you my background earlier in this question. Uh, I'm very curious to know for you, what has been your approach getting into the fountain pen hobby? Did you go more heavily into pens or were you more attracted to the ink? Maybe you're in it right now. Maybe you're looking to get into the fountain pen hobby and you want to talk about the approach you might take. Maybe you it's been 20 years and you don't even remember. But I'm curious to hear kind of what your story is because I think it's really fascinating. Um, that's all I got for you this week. Uh, thanks for tuning in on Q&A. Had a good time. Look at that. Didn't even have a coughing fit. Adequately prepared, set you up for it, but ended up turning out okay. So it all worked out. Really appreciate you hanging out with me today. This has been fun. Uh, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. You can check out some of what I talked about here on GoulayPens.com. And uh, I hope to join you again next week. Thanks so much for watching, and right on.